and welcome to the Dao Yi Roundtable series. My name is Robert Coons. Um, the Roundtable series is where we get experts in various fields related to cultivation of the Dao, the internal martial arts, Qigong, or Chinese medicine together to talk about interesting subjects that, that pertain to us all. Uh, today, joining me are Mimi Guo Diemer and Nathan Bryan, uh, respectively from England and Canada. And both of them are experts in the E word. The E word means energy, which is ostensibly the topic for the day. We're going to talk about internal energy, maybe external energy, and um, how we can perhaps better understand this term, uh, maybe reimagine it even, and how people can get more benefit from their practice of Qigong meditation and other energetic arts. Hello, Mimi and Nathan. Hey, Robert. Hello. Nice hey, to see Nathan. you both again. All right. Well, so we've I've talked to you both separately in the past, but now we're all together in one place. And um, may may I just say that I really like your background settings. I I have not learned how to make a studio yet. This is my my best attempt so far. Um, but Nathan, your library make really is is beautiful. That's you know I don't I I can't say anything beyond it. I'm 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 in awe. And uh, Mimi, I I love the use of the the plant in a juxtaposition juxtaposition with the with the writing on the wall i think it's absolutely brilliant so perhaps um perhaps i can help you guys uh, i can get you guys to help me with my feng shui um <laughs> but so for anybody who hasn't seen the the first two interviews that we we did with you guys um number one what, what, are you living under a rock go check them out but number two um can we get you to introduce yourselves uh, a little bit again um because I introduced you in the order of Mimi and Nathan, I want to switch it around. So Nathan, can we get your introduction first and then follow up with Mimi? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me back. Um, it's great being here. Um, who am I? I'm still trying to figure that out, to be honest. Um, so I'm, a, uh, I guess, a bit, I started practicing the internal arts um, in the late 90s um, and fell in with a, a Taoist group um and really fell in love with the whole Taoist tradition as well as the internal arts and ener energy traditions of China. Uh, at, so at some point, I decided to move there and uh, lived there for several years, training with different different masters and working on my Mandarin and having lots of good food. Um, it it was it was fun, intense. Uh, I then came back to Canada and um, really didn't know what to do with my life after that I wasn't in a position where I wanted to start teaching what I had learned yet I just didn't think I was good enough um and so I decided to go to university and spent about eight years at the University of British Columbia and uh, grad school there um really looking deeper into um old China stuff uh including classical Chinese and um Chinese thought um, religion, lots of Taoist studies. Um, and that was, that was, you know, that was what it was. Uh, and at some point I met my, um, my Taoist teacher, he's Wang Liping and he's a Dragon Gate, um, lineage Taoist guy. Uh, and he, his main focus is internal alchemy and teaching internal alchemy within a context of Taoist cultivation. So I call it Taoist alchemy. Uh, and so I spent, a long time with him, kind of dropped out of grad school and just went full time with him. Um, I was really excited to start learning that stuff. It's what I originally wanted to learn, but I couldn't find a teacher uh, for a long time. Um, and so I just dived into it uh, and still train with him. And at some point he told me to start teaching. So I, I've done that. Um, and then he told me to start writing some books. So I've done that. Um, I'm still writing books, still teaching, still practicing, uh, living in Vancouver. Um, yeah, just enjoying life. Brilliant. That's a very nice and, and succinct self-introduction. So as you can obviously hear, Nathan has an ocean of experience in this field. So it's going to be fascinating uh, ch ch chatting with you today. But Mimi also has an ocean of experience. You might even say that one is the Southern Sea and one is the <laughs> Northern Sea. 
Can you tell us a little bit about, and you get to decide, of course, which seeds you want to represent. Uh, Mimi, can you tell us a bit about your experience? I'm a little bit like Nathan. I am still figuring out who I am, but I, I think that I'm letting go and more and more of a sense of self and identity. Um, I was recently asked uh, in an interview for one of my alma maters, which is SOAS, the University of London uh, School of, formerly known as School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, and they asked me at the end, the interviewer, she said, could you choose three words that would describe you? You know, would it be something like teacher or author or what, you know, whatever. And what came to me was lover of practice. Uh, so those were three words. <laughs> and that sort of shaped my trajectory, I feel, over the last, gosh, I would say dedicated uh, time of 22 years of teaching. Um, and prior to that, uh, an affectionado of yoga and then later Qigong and now of uh, Bagua Zhang and trying my hand at Tai Chi Chuan. I have a very good teacher, but she's always just picking out my, my, um, my, my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> as she should, which is really helpful. You know, she's excellent. Um, so I, yeah, I'm less and less teaching and moving in the spheres of yoga these days. And it was a very solid foundation for me for decades. And for different reasons, I've uh, shifted more towards Qigong um, and then now more towards internal martial arts, which has sort of blown my world open uh, and I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm besotted <laughs> with, uh, with everything that I'm being exposed to. I have a shifu who's in Beijing, um, and learning from him when I can, I'm going back to do in-person studies with him. Um, but yeah, I would say that's a, a quick synopsis. I, um, in terms of my love of practice, it, it includes those areas and studies and, Taoism has definitely stood at the very forefront, as well as Buddhism, um, yoga originally, but it's again kind of shifted more in the direction of Buddhism and Taoism. I feel Buddhism and Taoism for me really have a lot of um, helpful, resourceful crossover as I learn more about each um, tradition, trajectory, philosophy. And I live in the British countryside. I have um, my dog next to me here, Bao Bao. His name is Bao Zi, which means, you know, dumpling or steamed bun. <laughs> um, and we have three cats, six, no, eight chickens. Um, we are learning about the cultivation of wild bees and our colony unfortunately collapsed over the last, last year. Hopefully some new ones will move in. Uh, but originally from upstate New York and then Tucson, Arizona. Also like Nathan, though, spent quite a long time in China, uh, started going back from 1981 onwards. And yeah, I was really privileged to see uh, the different uh, ways that China began to change and shift and open up and close down and, you know, can, it's just the, the the expansion and contraction, the condensing and releasing of uh, um, the last few decades that has been a privilege to to be witness to. So, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Marvelous. Okay. Well, good. So we we know more about you now. So uh, as I mentioned today, the 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 big story is about the the e word, which is um, energy, and we used to use this word a lot. Um, in contemporary qigong and, and meditation and the internal arts. Um, and I'm uh, just gonna turn off the light there, there, that fixed the red problem. Um, so we used to use that term a lot, but it's kind of fallen out of fashion recently. And um, I think that when we were chatting before, before the meeting, we kind of came around to the synopsis that um, maybe it would be nice to reinvigorate it a little bit. It seems kind of unfair that it went away. So maybe we could start by each of us talking a little bit about um, what that what that term means, uh, energy, when we apply it to these practices, and then um, 
maybe why it is that some ideas about why it might have fallen out of fashion and then why we personally think it would be nice to bring it back and and feel free to you know jump in and out whenever you like but um do, does one of you especially want to pick it up right now no pressure go for it Mimi yeah <laughs> Oh, I love the word energy, but I think chi as a translation of energy is only semi-representative, but it's a good, it's a good translation. It can also be breath, uh, pneuma, but I, I, I thought about this a while back about the character for chi, which is you both know, and maybe um, others who are listening know has rice as one radical and steam as the other radical in the classical um, Mandarin or Chinese configuration, character configuration. Um, so that in and of itself says there's something about nutrition, right? nourishment or a seed and something about change and transformation that fire applied to water creating steam changes this seed or grain of rice into something that we can eat and derive nourishment from. Uh, and energy, I feel, is the reason why all three of us are sitting here. It is the reason why all three of us are sitting here. And when people shy away from the term energy, uh, I think it's in part because it's become associated with something a bit more esoteric or hard to pin down or uh, mystical or been diluted and lost its currency as a result by being thrown around in many of these um, new age or wellness circles as something that one can get more of or uh, use to affect others or use in a way that um, has magical potential or capacity or something a little bit hard to believe. It, it, it lends a little bit of mm, discredit, it, it, it discredits it sometimes. But the same amount of energy is here today, I, I know, I believe, as there was at the beginning of the, the universe. Right? There's gravitational energy, thermodynamic energy, light, sound, uh, uh, kinetic, nuclear. I mean, I think there's nine different types of energy. And what I love is that the first law of thermodynamics says that no energy can be created or destroyed within a closed system. It can only be transferred. And so everything that happens in the known universe is a movement of energy. It's being transferred in some way. Then take this into the idea of a kernel of rice with fire and water. And what you see happening in that character is an energy transfer. And for me, what happens with practices and energetic practices is that we're taking the available energy that's here in the universe. And I say that with both the scientific understanding and just whatever cosmological belief one has about universe. Uh, and we're looking at, is this energy transference happening in a way that is healthy, that is open, that is uh, bringing about an effective nourishing change? Or is there a block to that transfer of energy? Is there an excess or deficiency that's arising as a result of energy trying to be transferred that can't? And what we're, what we are is a composition of uh, all kinds of things giving us energy and we are then giving out energy. You know, every time we eat anything our, um, or, or we breathe, our cells, our, the mitochondria are just ready and willing and waiting for energy transfer. Right? They're, they're wanting um, chemical energy through sugar or um, through oxygen, uh, whatever they're taking in through osmosis into into the cell wall, right? They're 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 wanting that chemical energy so that they can convert it into electrical energy, which is adenosine triphosphate (ATP), and that's what fuels life. 
right? energy isn't some kind of woo woo thing. It's like every living thing uses this process of energy conversion to give itself nourishment. So for me, Qigong practice is an invitation to become more sensitive to the way in which we might be allowing for or the way in which we might be unintentionally blocking a flow of energy that is looking for a healthy transfer but may not be able to achieve it because of whatever conditions might block or pre prevent a, a healthy transfer of that. So, you know, I love the word energy <laughs> because it just, it's what's happening to help keep us going. Um, but that those are just some thoughts that I've had over the last couple of years. Uh, but curious, Nathan, though, or... Yeah like how that sits with you or <laughs> no for sure absolutely I think it's I think what you say what you're saying is resonating with me um I also like the word energy I think it's a um, a simple easy word we have in English to express the experiences that we have when we when we practice mm. so why not use it I think um I think as long as we you know just keep everything anchored within practice and experience embodied sort of understanding of like embodied experience there's something that's happening when we practice um very um, um very real experiences of what i would call energy um and so then how do uh how do i as a as a practitioner and a teacher and a, or an author express that to others um, in English, well, yeah, energy is the go-to. I mean, it's just it, it's it's just such an easy term that that encapsulates. I think it, it's not exactly what she is. Um, you know, translation is um, you know it's half interpretation. There's no perfect mapping of one language onto another. Um, you know, I think I, I was hanging out with some Tibet with a Tibetan teacher in in Taiwan for a while, and they used the term wind. So they talk about the internal mm. winds of the body. That's kind of a metaphor metaphor that they would use to understand the or to communicate the experiences that they're having inside the body. Mm. Um, and I think, like you said, yeah, I think here in the West, maybe the words become energy has become sort of cheaply used, like it's. It, it, it's becomes it, be, it was over maybe it's become overused and um used maybe when there isn't an actual experience of energy or 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 something i think if we think too much about it i think that's also an issue and i think that's what's happened a bit here in the west is we're a little too thinky um and so we create these sort of complexities that really don't exist if it, like if you have the experience of energy you just you have it it's there if we start thinking about um you know what is it and and how to is it the right translation of that term and what does chi actually mean and that, that, that and we start to kind of get stay in the head with it then yeah it's going to get kind of maybe a little weird you know a little convoluted uh, so i think if we just sort of step back from that and just experience it within our practice within our practice you know as practices we have some methods we apply the methods we get results uh, in the form of experiences um it's like data that we can gather it's like we're going into our we're scientists going into our laboratory and we're, we're um um performing um an experiment okay i'm gonna apply this method if i breathe like this focusing here doing this what's gonna happen um and then we get this data and, and then we can go to you know and, and begin to understand the practices through that very embodied experiential mode um then yeah from that perspective energies energies it, it just makes sense it's just simple easy to use um and and the more i practice the more i get to that place where we are just energy you know we're like these energetic spiritual beings in a physical casing and the more we, the more I practice myself, the more I realize that there's just so much more to us than that. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of that, especially with the, the sort of Taoist approach is, um, is chi, is energy. That's a big part of who we are. Um, and I think if we keep the term as chi, like in academia, I would never use the word energy just because that's 
that's the game that's being played. You you leave it untranslated as chi. Uh, mm-hmm. Don't try to translate it. And sure, that's that works within that context. But um, as practitioners, I think the term is is very is very useful, and it's just it can help us uh, tune into something really profound and special that's happening with the practice. Um, we're more than just a physical meat suit and the thoughts <laughs> in our mind. Uh, there's there's our energy, and then you, and then that's just one thing. That's the the ren the, the the human body. You also have the tin the the celestial body, um, and those th- and that's a whole other. Like you're talking about Mimi, that's a whole other um, sphere of energy. There's a lot of energy outside of us, and 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 through these practices, getting connected with the external. It's a big mm-hmm. part of 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 the Taoist um, approach and other approaches as well, right? And so I think if we sort of some, somehow kind of like sidestep that term energy, um, it's just a really easy term in English that we have. <laughs> Let's use it, you know. Um, it can just, it really, I think it really, I think when I talk to my students with the term energy and, and write about it in my books, um, I still use the word chi as well. Um, but I think it just very clearly and succinctly um, expresses the experience that um mm-hmm you have when you practice these arts. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that energy is to chi as a potato is to a sweet potato. And what I mean is that if you look at the growth of, of tubers or you look at a, a rhizome in general, what you get is something that can grow in many different directions. So typically when you have, um, let's say a, a normal plant that grows from seed, the roots, they, they tend to sort of extend uh, far, far under the ground, but they, they're going always in this particular sort of root direction. Whereas when you have a, a tuber, when you see how, how a potato grows, it's, it's um, you know, the tendrils that come off of it, they can really go anywhere. And so this idea of um, qi, when you apply it in using Chinese language, there's so many different variations of chi and there's so many variations of words that have the the characters chi in them like um if you read really old taoist manuscripts you always come across this term yin yun yin yun means um condensation and evaporation and this is something that's applied you know to nature it's also applied to the human body so you have these old texts like ling bao jing where they talk about you know the sun uh, evaporating the water and the water is going up to the heavens and then coming back down in these various different forms that are affected by the chi in the environment, which is relative to heat, relative to time of year, and multiple different factors, all of them falling under this category of chi. Mm-hmm. Well, when we apply that same idea in English, we don't we don't have a perfect functional meta category to describe that. Um, it's a really overhead view of things, and if you go far back far back enough into medieval European literature, you find out that they have somewhat similar ideas, um, oh. Numa being one of them, but we don't use those terms anymore. We've we've effectively eviscerated our traditional culture um, in favor of modernity, whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. But um, what, we, what we can do is we can use terms like energy, which are also very broad. So when you have... Um, a term like energy, we we talked about it. Um, Mimi talked about it in terms of sort of a, a function of uh, biology, for instance, or a function of nature that ties all of nature together, including um, the physiological processes of life. But then, at the same time, we can also talk about energy in a, a subjective way. So we could say, uh, today, you know, I'm feeling kind of low energy, or I'm feeling kind of I feel high, I have great energy. Um, we could use it to refer to our, our felt sense of vitality. And so when we practice self-cultivation using chi or using, you know, spirit or, or whatever, all of these different facets of how we practice, it's making an adjustment actually also of the subjective environment of our, our own experience. And that has a, a psychological manifestation and a physical manifestation, which although they're completely internalized by us, right, you wouldn't say... You know, if I'm sitting here with my hands closed up like a little baby on my lap, um, with my eyes closed, I'm sure that nobody, everybody around me just thinks I'm completely daft. But my experience after 15 minutes of that is that I I feel awfully good. And uh, and so 
that is definitely an improvement in my subjective sense of felt energy. Um, I'm sure that there's an, obje an objective element to it too. But I like this idea that just like chi, it's a word that's very flexible in its application. We don't have to get stuck into uh, an absolutist paradigm. And so as, as with the other reasons why perhaps people in, in certain areas have liked to devalue the term energy, I think there's always a, a tension, especially in the academic environment, uh, between the need for precision in definition uh, and the ability to allow culture to exist organically. And sometimes when precise definitions are not malleable enough within the within the context of, of studies, then we end up um, in a situation where culture becomes inorganic. And so I felt for a little while now that this idea of taking, you know, because in 1980s Qigong culture, energy was a very commonly used idea in, in China uh, from the 70s, 80s until the end of the Qigong fever, right? People were doing serious research into this. And never mind some of them were wearing tinfoil hats. You have to accept that tinfoil hats exist in culture, and it's not everybody that, that wears them. Um, and so this this whole thing about you know there not being a connection to energy, well, people thought there there was for a long time, and it became unfashionable because qigong went through through a hard time. Um, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't be further researched and further experienced by by people today, right? So um, that's kind that's kind of my take. But if we pick it up from there, so we've we've kind of talked about like um, let's say biological processes, things that happened after the Big Bang. Um, we touched on the idea that this does something really good to explain to us an experience that we have, right? As as Nathan said, maybe you need to take away from always defining things and actually go out and feel it and treat your life as a science experiment. So then that's a bunch of people. We collectively we have, you know, probably more than 60 years of experience between us. What if um I'm a brand new student of of Qigong or or Taoism? And I was like, okay, well, that's that's fine. That was great. But uh but what what the hell are you guys talking about? Anyone want to take a crack at that? <laughs> um I don't yeah, I would say. I don't think it really matters. Um, and what I mean by that is be open. Don't try to define it, what it is, why. Not really important. Just do the practice. Mm -hmm. um, do the practice. Because it takes time to for most people to tune into the, the subtle body and tune into that more subtle part of ourselves. Um, if we... Mm -hmm think about it too much is kind of going to just get in the way of that experience. And um, it's important. It's important. I, I, I guess what I've learned from my teacher and the way I teach is it's just, I think it's so important to let the the practice drive the car um, and sort of the experience that we get from that. Um, and then after begin contextualizing it and understanding it. So an example was in our lineage, we do a, um, um, we work with the internal organs a lot. Um, um, and so we have a practice where we tune into the various internal organs and work with them. Um, and it's forbidden in our lineage, there's different rules within the lineage. It's forbidden to look at a textbook before you do the practice. So if you go to, a, so no medical textbooks, no going to Google looking up where my internal organs are, you want to go in with a blank slate, just completely blank. Just apply the method methods and see what happens. Go in and you put your awareness and you know try to find your kidneys. Okay, it'll give you a general bar ballpark location. Just go in there and start working um, until you can feel your kidneys. And then when you feel them, it's they're just there. It's 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 a their physical energetic presence. Um, and that's the same with, with the rest of the organs as well. And so I think from my perspective, in terms of if I had a brand new new student, I would say just don't think too much. Just apply the apply the methods. 
um, and and see what happens. And then later on, we can start kind of maybe talking about a little more. But even then, I, I don't like to talk, you know, it's, um, I'm fine with the term and I'm fine just using a term, even if it's not defined, because I think it's, it's each of us needs to define these terms for ourselves and come to understand what does chi mean? What does energy mean? Um, so I guess my perspective, the way I kind of approach things is very kind of radically subjective. Just go into it yourself as a subjective experience instead of kind of making a, an abstraction or object, object um, kind of trying to come up with some sort of objective truth. And I think with the Western intellectual tradition, that's very much kind of what you do. Uh, you don't go, you don't want to be subjective, right? Subjective equals um it's false. It's 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 limited. We you, you, we want a nice objective uh, field of truth that we can work from, um, and that's 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 nice in theory. But I think in practice, we need to go through the body, um, through the practice, to arrive at it. And so I, I I'm happy you know using the term energy and whatnot, and then allow the student themselves to try to explore for themselves what that term really means through their own experience, um, just providing methods, clear methods for, for working with that. I think Zhu Xi, the great Neo-Confucian, is spinning yeah. in his grave. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I would, um, it's a couple of things that Nathan, you were saying really, uh, touched me. One was this idea of not knowing where the organs are and going in and having this blank canvas and, and sensing into what it is that one feels uh, and, and where the attention or intention might then um, consolidate or, or focus. And I get this question quite a lot, which is, you know, I had my gallbladder removed. What you know, what does this mean? Can I still do Qigong practices related to gallbladder, wood energy, or where would I focus? And my response is always, the gallbladder is only one part of a, a, an extensive meridian system that runs through the whole body. And, and each of these meridian systems, the organs themselves may be quite valuable at times, and they, they may be sort of the particularly yin organs like holding the, the energy and the chi the charge um but the meridian system is is what we treat often right or what we really look look at and so that really broadens the possibilities for people to um do organ meridian work to not necessarily just look at the exact placement in the body of a particular organ that um you know, is, is their focus. So that was really cool. Um, and it's, it's an interesting question of this, you know, the subjective and the objective. And for myself, you know, I've sort of straddled two uh, educational systems and cultural systems um, or cultural upbringings. And I would say on the whole, it was, much more orientated toward the subject, uh, toward the objective. My father um, rejected Qigong and he was of the generation that was very much looking at why China had failed when confronted with Western science, technology, like many intellectuals of that generation in the era, you know, really questioned the, the, the superstition that and that the feudal ways of um, you know uh, medicine or um, technology that he felt held China back. Um, and interestingly, though, as a scientist, he towards the end of his life really looked at not knowing and the intersection of particularly uh, quantum physics and religion and. He believed that we are all energy and that we go back into the source of energy that gave rise to the, the manifest. Um, and 
he was definitely very Taoist in many ways. He just rejected the aspects that he felt didn't fit into his subject or objective points of view at different times in his life. And I, I feel like when I try to think about teaching students and introducing students to this practice that has been, uh, you know, um, has opened up such wonders for me and, and, and really been uh, so transformative at a deep level for me. I, 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 I try to straddle both the subjective and the objective when I meet a student, because I feel like if I'm only in the subjective, then I might lose a lot of potential interest even if I just say uh, fully trust uh, in in this process, even though I I myself may feel more inclined to just stop thinking, fully trust, enter into the practice, feel embodied. But when I I, I work with a lot of um, uh, teachers who want or people who are either teachers or want to start teaching qigong and i do an informal mentorship i've been doing this for the last few years and inevitably people want to know why why this how why why and i'll tell you two stories around this <laughs> my tai chi teacher i hope she doesn't mind that i share this i think she'll be fine she says you know all of my students are always asking me why 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 and she she said it in chinese and then she says yeah why 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 what you i'll leap it out f -E c k <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> what i hear is that you you <laughs> And so she's she's just frustrated by that. Um, but then when I when I hear this yearning, this longing to know, to understand, to define, to have explanation, I just say, you know, similar to you, Nathan, I say all of us have ten teachers, don't we? Like, all, and, and those ten teachers disagree with each other, don't they? Like for years, I was taught a very gendered binary way of putting your hands on your dantian, like men left over right, whatever, women right over left. And then the dantian was also two inches beneath the navel. And this was coming from someone who I definitely felt had the authority to tell me these things. And, and his authority came back, you know, or went back to probably 2000 years ago. Right? <laughs> and then someone else Ooh, I meet, another awesome. teacher, says, no, 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 no. The Dantian is definitely the belly button and you you don't uh, have to put one hand over the other. It doesn't matter. Like the Tao is non-binary, right? We, we like categorizations, like Meshifal, if you say this, like we like categories of male and female of left side has the heart, so that's yang and right side is yin, but all of these are just limiting us. You know, these, these definitions, these ways of have to and must be and shoulds. And all we do is one of my other Dharma teachers says is end up shouldn'ing all over ourselves. <laughs> and so I just said to my students, like, listen to the myriad views and re recognize that the views and the ways of doing things are helpful. But ultimately, like you pointed to, Nathan, it's just about your embodied sense of, of what is actually useful, what feels right. I, and the, the, the moving beyond views and opinions and the rights and wrongs, the highs, the lows, right? The, the Tao is great about teaching us the value of, of seeing beyond um, what is long and short, how they you know depend on each other or pitch and tone harmonize each other before and after follow each other, difficult and easy, depend on each other, you know, being and non-being generate each other, all of these contrasts, right? They're just there to just make us think too much. But like you said, <laughs> stop thinking about it, right? But you have to, I, I, I feel like we have to acknowledge and respect where people are coming from sometimes. Like there is a subjective view that's helpful and there is objectivity that 
we've all, I particularly have been schooled in to be critically minded and to have some, you know, tug at a, a, a question before I just swallow it. Um, and I, I, I feel like, yeah, it's helpful. And I want to respect that. And, you know, there's always oh, going to be so many people saying this is the right way to do things. And ultimately, just got to do the practice. See for yourself. <laughs> so that, that I think both of you have compelling arguments. And, and uh, it's also interesting to look then for a synthesis. Um, every once in a while, I try to get outside of my bubble because my bubble is... It's <laughs> very rarefied. And uh, so I, I'll go and, and study other things for a while just to see what they're about. And um, one of the things I studied a little bit last year was, was um, I'm going to slaughter the pronunciation, but Murakaba, which is, um, is a Muslim meditation system that um, if you had to define it by Qigong terms or by Taoist terms, Basically, it's a direct cult cultivation of the central channel. They have a really kind of interesting technique they have to activate the, the central channel. Um, that's probably not how they would describe it, but that was my my subjective experience of it as a, as a Qigong or meditation person. And um, one of the cool things that the teacher said was, um, if you want to understand your relationship with the outside universe, look at your hand and uh, get a good idea of what your hand looks like and how it feels, right? Where the hand starts and stops. And then close your eyes and then try to get a sense of where your hand starts and stops. And very quickly, you're going to find out that without having your, your eyesight to place the hand as a physical object, then you actually enter into a place where it's not as easy to understand the exact borders of where the material of you ends and the material of the universe outside of you begins. And so I, what, I, what I often think is that any of these methods that are directed toward a certain type of realization and a certain type of energetic manifestation, um, there's there's a bunch of different ways of doing it, but they can expose something to us which is broadly at least similar enough to be able to um, appreciate each other's contexts, let's say. And um, then when we boil it down to the level of technique or method or philosophy, then, uh, of course, sometimes the argument within individual schools of thought is actually more aggressive than the argument between schools of thought. Like if you ever re read these old Nadan texts, these some of these guys were really fussy. <laughs> They're really fussy about the things they like and they don't like. And not only that, but sometimes they're contradictory with, with each other or even within the same text. You could have a text telling you not to visualize. And then later in the text, it's telling you to put the sun in your tailbone and shine it up into your head. So, you know, from my perspective, I see sometimes the 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 need to be um, very particular. It's not only a Western thing; it, it happens in in every culture in different ways. But that the more the risk of being very very um, particular about the ideas of practice is that if you don't have a, um, a perfect explanation that can be replicated every time as you explain it, then it doesn't do a good enough job to completely describe the process. So I'll use meditation as an example. Um, we often talk about, you know, first you refine the Jing and then you transform the Qi, then you refine the Qi and you transform the Shen, then you refine the Shen and transforms, you know, spirit and then, uh, sorry, as if transform void and then, and then void harmonizes with the Tao. Well, the way that people are defining Jing, let's say, um, there's a there's a reasonable consensus in Taoism about what Jing is and isn't. But the problem is that if you were to apply that to your body and you were to say, well, you know, where is my Jing, right? Where's my Jing located? If I wanted to think about it as something which is, which is objectively measurable, um, you could make the argument, okay, well, maybe Jing is physical tissue or maybe Jing is, uh, you know, in some instances is fluid or, or even sexual fluid. 
Well, what about you and Jing, right? The original Jing. Because they're all, they take great, great pains to say this is not part of your, you know, physical infrastructure in a sense. It's beyond your ability to, to comprehend on a physical level. Um, it's really hidden deeply in the darkness and it happens to be, you know, located in the so-called water palace. But um, it's, it's not something that you can touch. Well, how the hell are you going to run a double blind study to find your Yuan Jing? Right or Yuan Qi or you know, Yuan Shen, and and when you think about something like Shen, um, you could say, okay, Jing, I got the idea. It's trapped inside physical substance. Qi, okay, I got the idea. At least it's tangible enough that I can feel it move in my body. Shen, wow, where the heck is that? Because every time I try to go behind my Shen and find it, it's my Shen, you know, my probably my ego, you know, my mind going behind my Shen, but I can't actually look at the spirit from another angle. There's no way to get out of your spirit and look at your spirit. And so the problem is then that if you try to really hammer down these things um, in a way that would, you know, make the the researchers at, um, you know, a, I don't know, academic institution that deals with, with biological studies happy, um, I'm afraid that that would be a fool's errand. And so one of the I think reasons why sometimes things like qigong or meditation that is energetic in nature or even Chinese medicine are, are a little bit dumped on by the, the medical community is that they're dealing with aspects of being which work in systems. They don't work in necessarily in perfectly um, objective little materialist bundles. And so if you, I think one of the biggest problems for us looking at these things, whether we say objective or subjective, because I think there's a there's a place for both, as, as I agree with Mimi on this. But the problem is that when you look at something through a materialist lens, which is the current scientific paradigm, right? So our, our when in the West or in the modern world, science is really dominated by materialism, which basically views all things as being composed of actual physical substance. So you can't measure something if it isn't, if it can't be physicalized or physically rationalized in some way. Um, the problem with that is that that's a different paradigm. It's based on different basic principles to the majority of human culture throughout history. And the issue is we make the erroneous assumption that materialism is automatically true rather than saying materialism is a current world paradigm, which is very powerful and very useful across a lot of different contexts, but that other um, methods of knowing are also, wow, I sound like a postmodernist here, but other methods <laughs> of knowing are you know, also valid within certain particular contexts. And it's not, it's not wrong to say that I, I can feel chi, right? That's uh, if you you can treat it, uh, you can teach a person to feel chi in a very short period of time. But then, if you were to say, "Well, can you tell me what that is?" You know, physically in a way we could test it. No, not maybe you could do some readings of what's going on in the neurologically, but that wouldn't tell you. That wouldn't get you any closer to what chi is. There was an interesting study that was done in two thousand eight, where. Uh, basically, the result of the study was that they discovered that um, meditators and long distance runners both experienced large releases of uh, endorphins. And so the thing that caused the runners high in, in certain contexts in certain schools of meditation were also causing the, this wonderful ec ecstatic meditative experience. That's, that's great because it tells us something concrete, but still doesn't tell us what she is. <clears throat> or consciousness. I mean, it cannot, and there's, there's, we're, you know, very far from defining it. We might have a location uh, as like a quantum wave moving through one of the um, two you know, brain tubulars of, I don't know what it is, but yeah, there's Shen, right? That's how are we ever going to define that? How are we ever going to define consciousness? But I do feel like we can, I feel very comfortable thinking of myself as particles that are constantly changing and we're just energy bodies that are moving, shifting, impermanent, changeable. 
And so like Nathan is often sort of pointing to in the conversation is this embodiment. And what we can know is our breath. What we can know is the felt experience. And when I think people do Qigong and do Nadan or do internal alchemy practices, what arises potentially and why it's so attractive is a building of sensitivity to that. And you know, we've you mentioned you're feeling very postmodern, but just on the whole, I feel like we, our society is marching in like a machine and we've like lost a lot of just the natural rhythms. We've exchanged those in favor of societal and, and business rhythms, but something like Qigong, something like meditation, something like uh, really deep embodied practices give us back what we've sort of had take, taken away uh, or we've given away in terms of just this naturalness uh, and this receptivity and this sensitivity to what we can immediately know, what we can immediately sense and uh, call it energy or call it attention, call it consciousness. You know, it's there. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful resource. Yeah, it's, a, it's available. And mm. I think it's been, I think it's, yeah, my, I think modern society, I think it gets lost. Um, I think those old ways of knowing what your father would say, <laughs> superstitious <laughs> rubbish that, um, you know, but there's, I think the problem with thinking about stuff is it gets very black and white. Um, yes, no, binary. Um, and I think, I think, ironically, <laughs> that <laughs> um, that can mess us up and it, it kind of sets a certain trajectory um, um, that can miss stuff because we're never as smart as we think we are. We never have all the, the data, the data. Um, and Sorry, anyway, one... yeah, yeah, I saw oh, your dog he's... walking around there. Yeah, he's getting like restless. Oh, um, yeah, I'll wait. That's a nice room. That's a nice space. It is a nice room, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We need to get some intermission music. Yeah. <laughs> a little interlude. Yeah. You know, I miss the old movies where they would have I twenty minutes of yeah. orchestra. You know, like yeah. Doctor Zhivago. Or... Yeah. 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 Hi. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> welcome back. We're admiring your room. It's just a beautiful space. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I just, I was, you know, I think, I think if we think <laughs> too much, and I think fundamentalism as well as a, I'm fundamentally against fundamentalism. Um, I think when we get really attached to ideas and, and right and wrong, and I'm right, you're wrong. And, and you know, that's the way sort of the Western philosophical models kind of set up as, you know, there's a dialectic, you know, someone says, I say this, this is why. And then someone critiques that, you know, set up an art, a binary argument, and you try to get somewhere, evolve to the truth and get the truth. Um, and there's, I think there's a real place for that. I think it's, it's quite a powerful way, kind of a powerful epistemological model, but it's not perfect. And I think what I'm offering, and I think what these, my teacher offer, I think what these energy arts offer is another, Com it can be complementary as well. Like I don't think it needs again. It doesn't need to be. You don't need to not think, right? It's just getting more in tune with feeling, subjective feeling, the body, energy, um, and then using that as a you know as a way of experiencing and perceiving and understanding ourselves, where we're from, who we are, where we're going. Um, there's space between the words in our head that um can be very profound um for giving us wisdom and understanding of thing i think i think i know for myself i used to be a chronic thinker when i was younger um and i think there was a sense for myself that outside of language there is nothing um in terms of truth or nothing 
Um, so why would I want to leave language and 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 that sort of way of thinking? But now, from my experiences with uh, with my teacher and what I've practiced, there definitely is. You can have you know complete stillness, um, absence of of random thoughts and thinking, um, and have a still a very pro. Uh, not still a profound perspective on reality and yeah. who 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 I am and and my place in the cosmos and um yeah so I think you know I think that sort of black and white thinking and 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 sort of that rigid model of intellectual activity has it's it's it has its place but man there's a whole other way that we can incorporate into and that's intuition um you know following our heart uh you know and, and if you're an, a rigid intellectualist you're like yeah but what does that mean what does that mean it doesn't mean anything but if you've you know if you've if, if you've worked with intuition it, it really does um mean something it's a very profound practice one we use in our lineage as well mm -hmm. there's a certain stage we we get um you go to where you need to use intu intuition to know what to do next. Um, it's kind of interesting. So in, anyway, so I guess it's just like, there's more to, to life than just think what we think. Um, and I think modern society is, is missing a lot of that. I think it's probably causing problems. You know, um, I think, I think that it, the more we can kind of get in tune with ourselves, intuition, feeling, um, doing things maybe without even knowing why we're doing them or, or having a complete understanding of what it's about, just doing it because it feels like the right in that moment. Um, that's, it's, I, um, I think it can get us more back on track. Um, it's less stressful. I think life becomes easier. Um, I think life can really open up and, and change for each of us in new ways once we sort of Maybe thinking it can be thought of as a tool. It's like, okay, it's a tool. It's a thing we put in a box, take it out, use it when you need it, but don't let it run the show. Um, yeah. It could also be a beautiful way though of what, I, what I'm hearing from you is the result of Wu Wei practice of effortless yeah. action for lack of a better translation, but that Wu Wei is... Um, in many ways, a deconstructing and a dehabituating of our tendencies. It's a Wu Wei is a practice as well as the outcome of practice. Uh, and I think um, thinking itself is a natural human tendency. Every, it's what our species is really gifted at. It's how our species has evolved and it's a wonderful tool, but it gets way more play than everything else that is also happening in our bodies and it's become so dominant but I think if we are to be welcoming of our thoughts to know our thoughts to have clarity around what are helpful and unhelpful skillful unskillful ways of thinking then that engenders wisdom and it engenders insight and it leads to the types of uh, states where humility arise, where we don't need to know. Uh, and I remember when I was in oh, college, high school, it was a Jonathan Spence book. It was The Search for Modern China. And the introduction to it, you might have it probably on your library there. But he wrote in the introduction, yeah, that the scholarship about China um, has, what was the quote? That as the circumference of our knowledge has increased, it has only been matched by the circumference of our ignorance. And I thought that was so wise and beautiful because it is probably someone at the top of his academic career, writing his last ode to uh, you know, his lifetime of work or writing the last book. And it was um, the humility you know, and to use his thoughts in, in, a, in a way that is really 
beautiful to know the thoughts and then to arrive at the conclusion of, I don't know that much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, t- my, uh, <laughs> my, my, yeah, <laughs> my teacher, Wang Li Ping, one of the first things he told me was we're, we're, it was after a session, we were walking back for lunch and he said, once you think, you know, you don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's like the first lesson he taught me. And That's it. it. Sense, you know? Yeah. And and it's it's also, I think, if we are in some way through these practices orientating towards uh, a, a sense of, of unity, of oneness, of um, aligning and harmonizing, uh, harmonizing with Tao, I think it is to be okay with all of the manifest world, all of the named world, everything that arises as our human experience is natural. Let it rip, but just don't let it dominate you. (laughs) Also be in touch with the source. Also know that there is the nameless, right? Also know that, that there, there is, uh, that the two are the same. Right. But if we only, I think my, my concern is in a lot of spiritual practices, there's bypassing, there's bypassing right. of the manifest to get to the source. You know, it's bypassing the, uh, the, all of the named things and saying, I am just at one. It's like, no, but you're a thinking, emotional, psychologically rich living creature, you know, own it, love it, embrace it, accept it, then transcend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. I, you know, I was, I was on retreat with my teacher recently and there was a, there was a, a young guy there in his twenties and he went, you know, teacher, I just, I have all these random thoughts and how do I deal with them? Like, how do I get past these? Like, oh, that's good. Mm. You're young. Random thoughts is that's creativity. <laughs> that's like you creating. That's, that's an important place for you to be. Mm. Enjoy them. <laughs> Go mm. with, they're not a bad thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm hearing you you saying as well. I think that's really yeah, and and I feel like that's that's the portal to deepening insight and freedom, right? To be free of the burden of thoughts, to to right. allow them to arise and allow all of the different uh, emotions, right? That our our organs may or may not have a role in. I I believe they have a strong role in in our emotional expression. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, to see them as natural, to see them as part of what makes us creatures that, that, that you know, are creative and dynamic and responsive, but then to also um, not take them too seriously. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> perfect. I love it. Yeah. So I think that today we've had a very, a very young discussion, very, very positive <laughs> The very young side of the discussion, and I might, I might have to. We don't have time for it today, but I might have to be very naughty and invite you guys back to have the yin side of this discussion mm. later, because it's so, it's so interesting, right? Because one of the things that that we've we've done today is we've we've sort of phrased this thing in a in an energetic way, in a sense. We've used the e word to uh, create a, a dynamic state, which is um, which is quite open, right? The, the discussion today has been very let's say it's a bit of a bird's eye view discussion. It's not the, it's not the one where you say, well, you know, you put your, your intention in this certain place and then, you know, you breathe this, this certain way or you move in a certain way and things happen. Uh, that wasn't today's discussion at all. Today's discussion was really looking at the, the big questions mm-hmm. from a number of different perspectives, which, which I think actually were very harmonious perspectives, um, which is good and also also very dangerous because you know we could be also succumbing perhaps to our uh, to our own biases since they're they're close enough together to harmonize. Um, but I don't think we're running any risk of starting a cult, so that's the uh, <laughs> that, that's the good thing. Um, but uh, I I think also that there is this um, this other side of things that that perhaps we could get together and talk about in the future, which is the the problem of the the particulars of not only practice but telos especially where uh you have this goal in mind but the problem is that the goal in mind as as nathan eloquently pointed out you know sort of sort of manifesting his teacher's words when you think you know this is you know really when you start getting into trouble 
but then there is also there is also this sense of telos as well and uh and and to me perhaps the 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 biggest problem that i've personally come across because i always try to think of these things in terms of of my problems about practice because i'm i'm very very lucky in the sense of not being very clever um up front so any 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 talent i've ever gotten it was really like I had to claw, you know, ever since childhood really have had to had to fight hard to get anything that I've got. Um, that's just I'm not just that person who can, you know, walk into something and be good at it. And so um, I always like to think of the problems of practice also relative to myself, because I've made a lot of the mistakes that people make. And uh, and I've I've had the problems come from those mistakes that you know that people get, and I think I've had the the problems of like perhaps ten people just because of this inability to have the natural aptitude, and so when I when I think about problems that are are ones that I've experienced or or ones where you get sensitive enough, intuitive enough, let's say, uh, to be able to see a problem you haven't had in another person, but be able to sort of understand what's happening to them, then I think that's where the there's a, a a balancing point between the um the objective and the subjective where you can you can give a person advice which is sufficient to help them but not so much that it closes down their mind to the possibilities and and i, I always worry that you know when people are very very particular and specific that that can have this this negative outcome that i see a lot in the martial arts this is so much worse in the martial arts where people's minds get closed around a person, a particular conceptual category. And, you know, for instance, there's a, let's say a, a certain style of Tai Chi that has, you know, 10 sub styles. And in each of those lineages, they all say, well, the grand master of the style had two students and my teacher was his best disciple. And mm -hmm. I'm my teacher's best disciple. And once people start saying that, then there's, you know, you have this wonderful community of people who practice the same thing slightly differently, I think, which is kind of like us today. And then when people then they get into this habit of, you know, pinning it down too well, you know, it, it really hurts actually the students. So if we do have this overhead discussion um, where we look at the thing from from all these angles that aren't the ones that you would normally think of if you were, let's say, if you weren't if you hadn't been thinking about this for a long period of time, the ideas that we mentioned today, I don't think are the most obvious ones. Um, but I want to invite you guys back next time so that we can, so that we can get into this other half of things, which is um, where you do set the rationale, because I think that, that we, we may also have a very um, even more diversified discussion there. So um, I think that today uh, with your blessings, it, it might be good to wrap it up here um we've we've done a lot you know this is um if 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 anybody i hope there are people taking notes here because you have a lot of pretty cool footnotes to follow up on and, and perhaps some thinking to do um but uh are you guys good with with finishing up here any any final thoughts i'd like to get your final thoughts first though i'm just really happy to to meet you guys and hang out with you guys i think um community is really important for me and i think as practitioners it can especially if you're not teaching luckily i am but it, it, you can get kind of isolated um so it's just fun hanging out with people who are into the same stuff <laughs> you know and uh and i, I really respect and, and love both you guys so uh thanks for thanks for having me here robbie mm, i echo that and uh i also just think i enjoyed listening to both of you so much i feel like i learned a lot and I have things to sort of embody and digest, and it was rich. I really appreciated both of the offerings that you made and contributions. Yeah. Okay, well, brilliant. Thank you both very much. This has been fun for me. And please stick around for a, a moment after I turn off the recording. But first, of course, we have to do our outro. Okay, everybody, um, thank you very much for joining us on the, the Dawi Roundtable series where we talk to experts of the various traditions that we're interested in. I hope that you took away a lot from this. It's like getting a, a giant cake of information that has all kinds of different tastes in it. Um, and uh, so I, I hope that it was a benefit to you and we'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.